I don't know if you've seen on the internets the project where somebody created a um, mechanical clock where it took a whiteboard marker and drew the time on a little whiteboard and then grabbed an eraser and then erased the uh, whiteboard. Um, it's a very cool project. I'll put a link to it in the description and you can take a look. But um, there is another, there was a remix on that um, done uh, by somebody who decided that an uh, UV LED and some um, glow-in-the-dark sticker paper would be um, uh, another way of creating a similar type of, of object. So this is a build of that fellow's um, design. So it's fairly simple. It takes an Arduino Uno to do the servo control. You could use any microcontroller, really, um, but the uh, the code is for, for an Arduino, so you can put anything in there. It doesn't have to be an Uno, because you really only need... Um, two, um, four pins, two pins to control your servos, one pin to control your, um, LED, and then, um, another pin that you can use to, um, uh, trigger when you're going to write out the time. Um, you could also do, set it up so that it'll, um, write out the time every minute. Um, I think that's what the whiteboard project did, but in any event, those are the things you need. Um, uh, then you need um, your um, uh, I squared C pins, the wire library, so that you can set up a real time clock. Now, if you had a microcontroller that had a built in real time clock, you could um, use that. But um, this project uses a real time clock um, add on chip, and the Arduino reads the real time clock when it boots up to get the time. And then this is my um, build of it, and I'm going to go through a few things. Um, that I discovered while I was building it, including um, a slight modification to the circuit that I needed to do in order to actually drive the LEDs that I had. Um, there's not quite enough power left over um, once you have powered up the servos and you're, and you're drawing. You don't have enough current left over to light up the LED, so um, just a simple um, transistor switch is what I used to um, pull power directly from the um, the five volt rail rather than um, pulling it from um, a pin power from a pin to power this so the pin actually controls um, a transistor and the transistor um, acts as a switch to um, switch current on and off on the LED the other thing that we're going to go through is some of the uh, inverse kinematics on these arms to try and um, see how the code is actually working so yeah, that's what our plan is for tonight, and let's get to it. All right, so let's do a little analysis on our drawing mechanism for the uh, for the pen plotter or for the LED plotter, glow in the dark plotter. Um, we would like to come up with a uh, parameterization of the mechanics here so that we can what we've got control over is two servo horns and we want to be able to by adjusting those servo horns do some drawing so we need to come up with the um, inverse kinematics to translate between positions in the xy coordinate system of where we're drawing to theta one, theta two angular positions of our two servos. And then once we've got that, then we can use rectilinear coordinates up here and um, write uh, the routines that will allow us to draw our numerals. So let's begin by drawing ourselves a little sketch of what we've got going here. So. Uh, something like that. Say so you got these two here, something there, something sort of there. Doesn't have to be perfect, it just needs to be somewhat representative. And I'm going to exaggerate a little bit here 
just to make the drawing easier. <clears throat> so, what do we know? We know all of these link lengths because they are directly measurable. I'm going to call that L1. That's the same length as that. These two lengths are the same length, and we're going to call that L4. So that's L4. We know what this distance is. We're going to call that L3. We can calculate this distance because we know this angle, 135, and we're going to call that L2. Okay, and we also know this distance here. Um, if we make our coordinates 0, 0 right here, that makes this, um, well, we're going to call that, this is x0, x2, y2. Let's call it that. And we're going to call this x0, y0 for the origin. All right. If we look at this, then we have a couple of other distances that we would like to be able to calculate. We would like to be able to calculate this length and this length, which we're going to call C and C1. And we want to be able to figure out what that point is there, which we're going to call X1, Y1. And what we've got up here is what our target position is supposed to be, T, X, T, Y. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what these two angles need to be. Let's call it theta 1 and theta 2 to get a position in XY space at the end of our linkage. So we're looking to come up with formulae that will allow us to, given a desired TX, TY, um, a target position, to figure out what angles these servos should rotate at to um, place our pointer at that position, TX, TY. Now, we got a whole bunch of triangles here. Oh, let, let's maybe make some notes about what we've got here um, in terms of lengths. L1, we know, is equal to 35 millimeters. L2, we calculate as 55.1. L3, we can, we've designed it to be 13.2. We've actually designed L2 to be that length as well because 135 and design this length. So this length and this length and this angle gives us this length, which is 55.1. And L4, we've designed that to be 45. And I say we because that's just how the design came to us. We're just doing an analysis on it. Now, in order to find um, angles in a triangle and relate them to the lengths of sides in triangles, a few formula come up very um, frequently. One of them is the thing called the law of cosines. And the law of cosines is in a triangle ABC with sides of length C, A, and B, and angles alpha, beta, gamma. C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cos gamma. So what this says is given two sides and an included angle, you can calculate the length of the opposite side. It's one thing it says. And notice that this is relating a couple of things about triangles. Triangles that have three known sides have fixed angles because um, it, um, it's rigid. 
a triangle is rigid. So this formula is sort of saying um, triangles are rigid if you've got the lengths fixed, all the angles have to be fixed. Also, if you know the included angle, this included angle and the lengths of the two adjacent sides, you can calculate the length of the other side because it has to be fixed. It can't vary. So this law of cosines gives you some kind of is a physical manifest, uh, mathematical manifestation of the physical rigidity property of triangles. Might be one way of looking at that. So there's a couple of different ways you can write this. This is the way you, you write it when you want to try and figure out what the length of it is given adjacent sides and an included angle. The other thing that you can do is calculate the angle given any side. So say we want to figure out gamma. Well, that's the same thing as saying a squared plus b squared minus c squared divided by 2ab, but take the arcos or the inverse. I wrote that kind of crappy. Um, so the angle is the arc cos of a squared plus b squared minus c squared all over 2ab. Or you can figure out the length of a side by taking um, the square root of a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cos gamma. So there's two ways of looking at that. The other thing that comes up quite frequently is our, our right angle triangle stuff. So um, if this is a and this is b and this is c, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The other thing that we need to remember is our um, calculating the length of the hypotenuse given um, an angle um, and, uh, and either an opposite or adjacent. So that angle, um, let's call that gamma, gamma is equal to the arctan of the opposite over the adjacent. So we can calculate that angle given those two. So that's another formula that comes in quite handy when we're calculating things. So we've got these four formulas that we're going to be using relatively frequently in our analysis. Okay. Okay, so let's begin. Um, what we're trying to figure out is, well, if we could figure out what this angle is and what this angle was, then this angle is 180 minus this minus this, because a full angle. So let's try and get that. In order to figure out this angle, we need to know the length of this side. Um, because then we will have three sides of known length, and then we can easily calculate this angle. So, first of all, C. Can we figure out what C is? Well, C, it turns out, isn't too hard to figure out, because we just drop a perpendicular here. And now we have... Um, a known distance here, so this is zero, so that means this is Tx, and then this distance is just Ty, so C is equal to the square root of Tx squared plus Ty squared. So now we know what C is, so that means we can calculate this angle, and let's call that alpha 1, just for argument's sake. And alpha 1, the included angle, is the arcos of um, adjacent squared, L1 squared, plus C squared, minus the opposite, L2, L2 squared, all over 2 times the adjacent sides, LC. All right, so that is giving us alpha. 
Now, the other thing that's easy to calculate is alpha 1 is this angle. So we've got this angle. Now what's this angle? Well, that is in this equilateral triangle and wait. Uh, yes, it's in this equilateral triangle. So um, let's call that alpha 2. Alpha 2 is equal to our tan opposite, which is Ty divided by Sadie. Ty divided by Tx opposite over adjacent. All right, all right, all right. Okay, awesome. Now we have cat hair everywhere. But anyways. So, um, that allows us to calculate theta 1. So that's equal to 180 minus alpha 1 minus alpha 2. All right, so we are well on our way. We've got half of our work done, sadly. That doesn't equate to half of our work. Because we've got to do some figuring to get what C1 is so that we can figure out what X1 and Y1 are. Now, how are we going to go about doing that? Well, um, we know what C is. So we, if we could find out this angle, we've got this length and this length. So if we could find this angle, which we're going to call beta 3, can we figure out beta 3? Well, if this was beta 1 and the whole thing was beta 2, then we would be able to figure out beta 3. So beta 2 is the angle given our included, it's our included angle between these two sides. We know all three. We know L2, L1, and C. So beta 2 is equal to our cos of L1 squared plus L2 squared minus C squared all over um, 2L1, L2. And do we know enough to figure out what beta 1 is? Beta 1 is the included angle. We know that, we know that, and we know that. Yes. So beta 1 equals our cos of L4 squared plus L2 squared minus L3 squared all over 2L4, L2. So beta... 3 equals um, beta 2 minus beta 1. So beta 3 is the whole thing minus that dead. So now we've got an included angle and two sides, so that means we can calculate the length of C1. So now C1 is equal to the square root of L1 squared plus L4 squared minus 2 L1 L4 cos beta 3. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. We've got theta 1. Now we've got C1. And what does that mean? If we can drop a perpendicular from C1, we can figure out X because we know the length of the hypotenuse. So basically, X1 is equal to C1 um, sine... Oh, hang on, 
Hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, anybody see the problem? This is not alpha 2. We need to figure out what this angle is in here. This small angle. We need to figure out what this small angle is in here because we want this angle, not this angle. All right. So with the hypotenuse C1. So what's this? Do we know the included angle? We, we know the length of C1. We know the length of C. We know length of L3. So we can find epsilon. All right. Um, and this is going to be sine of alpha 2 minus epsilon. That's what x1 is going to be. y1's a little... You no, know, we still need... And y1 is going to be equal to c1 cos alpha 2 minus epsilon. So we need to find the epsilon to get both of these. And, but that's just the Arcos formula again. So epsilon is equal to Arcos um, c1 squared plus c2 squared minus l3 squared all over c1 uh, 2 c1 c2. Am I doing twos? Twos, yeah. Just checking. So that's epsilon. We can calculate that, so now we can calculate x1 and x2. Excellent. x1 and y1. So now we know this point, and now let's move on to this triangle here and trying to calculate this. So now we know these two points, so that means we can calculate this distance, and we know this distance, so we know y. So it means we can calculate this angle. Um, let's call that gamma 1. And then we know this length and this length. If we can calculate this angle, that means we can calculate this length. Uh, well, actually, this length is easy, because once we know this length, then it's just the square root of um, y1 squared plus this distance squared. OK, so we can calculate that length. Yeah, we're all done pretty much. Uh, so, uh, gamma 1. We're on gamma 1. So, uh, uh, how was I going to do that again? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we're going to get, we're going to call this C2. This length here is C2. And that's this distance. So that is x2 minus x1 squared plus y1 squared. Take the square root of that, and that's c2. Because that's the hypotenuse of this right-angled triangle in here. Now that we have c2, we have all three sides. So this angle here, we're going to call that gamma 2. Gamma 2 is equal to our cos of um, c2 squared plus l1 squared minus l4 squared all over 2 c2 l1. And that's gamma. That means, uh, whoops, theta 2 is equal to 180 minus gamma 2 minus gamma 1. There we go. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. So we've got our two formulas that we need. We've got our um, theta 2 and theta 1, which are the angles that we're going to be moving our servos at to get into our target point Tx, Ty. And remember, that was all with respect to a coordinate frame with this as the origin. If we want to translate this x, y into a different coordinate system by just multiplying x and y, uh, the x value and y value, we can. So we could put our origin anywhere 
and these formulas would still hold. Wouldn't they? Or, yes, yeah, yeah. We've got an xy to get a ty, xy, and then relative to a coordinate, we just have to subtract or scale it down into that, that position. That's right. Okay. So we can define an arbitrary coordinate frame that we can translate around and then just have to remember to translate these tx and ty's in the new coordinate system. Very good. That is the formulas that we needed to know. Okay, so these servos have a, nominally 180 degrees of rotation that they're capable of. And the way that you um, access that 180 degrees of rotation is by sending a pulse train to the servos. So um, depending, um, see, I think it's a 50 millisecond frequency and then the width of the leading pulse will determine the position that the servos are going to sit in. So you've got a diagram that looks something like this. You've got a pulse of a certain duration, and then you've got another pulse of a certain duration. And this determines the frequency, and I think this is 50 milliseconds, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, anyways, and then the length of this pulse determines the angular position. So if you've got a narrow pulse, and these pulses... Now this is longer than 50 milliseconds. Um, anyways, because I, I think... Uh, let, me get, let me look at the data sheet. Okay, this is, this is um, 50 hertz. And that's equivalent to 20 milliseconds. And this angular position is determined by a pulse width that is um, somewhere between one millisecond and two milliseconds. So there's a blank time of up to 18 milliseconds between pulses, and then the total length of time um, of the pulse is 20 milliseconds, of the total frequency is 20 milliseconds. So we're measuring some fine times here, but yeah, anyways, that's that's how you address, or that's how you um, update servo. So when you're sending it a pulse, um, a 20 milliseconds uh, frequency or 50 hertz pulse train, where the initial pulse is one millisecond long, it'll be at position zero. And when you're sending it a pulse train that has this initial pulse at two milliseconds, again, at 50 hertz, you will have it at 180 degrees. So nominally. Now, there's all kinds of things, variability in manufacturing that mean you may or may not get all of it, or you might get more of that um, angular position depending on your servo. And as you can see here, um, these two servos are, are not, are, aren't, um, exactly equal in terms of how much rotation they get. So this one, I, I cannot get it to go any um, farther down. The other thing that happens is these horns have splines on them, and the splines might not be completely lined up um, on an axis of the on the axis of the servo. So you're, you're going to have to take that into account. So there's a couple of things that we have to do here. We have to, first of all, trim these out so that they produce 180 degrees of rotation, or we can figure out what um, the total amount of rotation is and, that, uh, and how that corresponds to the number of milliseconds that we have in our pulse train here. So microseconds, we're going to be in thousands. Um, and then we also have to um, figure out what um, accommodations we need to make for the misalignment between the axes of the splines and the primary axes of the um, 
the servo. So those are two geometrical things that we have to take into account when we're calibrating our servos. Then the other thing that we have to take into account is how what or what position we're going to mount the horns on these servos so that our our linkage can move in the working area that we need it to move in. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Let me unplug this because that's a little bit annoying. So for example, to get down into the lower left-hand corner there, we're going to need to have angular positions that are something like that. And then into the upper right-hand corner, we're going to have to have angular positions that look something like that. And then to get down to the bottom here, we have to do something like that. And then to get over there, we have to do something like that. So we need to be able to um, uh, mount our horns on our servos so that the 180 degrees of travel that we have available to us is sufficient to um, move the horns in the positions that they need to be moved into. And it looks like we should be okay because we've got something here and something over there. So that's less than 180. And we've got something here um, going down to here, kind of, and then going up to there. And so this angle looks like it's less than 180. So it looks like we're, we're okay. But let's do the calculations to figure out um, if we are actually okay. And to do that, we'll need our this diagram that showed us what our geometry was and how we calculate theta 1 and theta 2, which are these two angles here. And so let's, uh, I don't know if it's worthwhile running through that or not. At least let, let me explain the calculations. Okay, so that's our origin there. And by the design of, well, let's say it's 22 or 23. This corner here, so the x is negative 23, let's call it. Yeah, something like 32. Okay, so 23, 32. And then how high is this? Let's say, now Now we're just defining our, our build volume. So let's call that 38. So negative 23, 70. And then this would be, well, how far over is this side? Should we call it 45? So, 45, 70, and then negative 23, 70. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, 45, 32. Why is 32 along here? Why is 70 on here? Why is negative 23 along? X is negative 23 along here, and X is 45 along here. So yeah, so now um, we need to calculate our theta 1 and theta 2 for those four positions so that we can figure out um, <clears throat> what theta 1 needs to be, or what range theta 1 needs to fall in and what range theta 2 needs to fall in. Okay, so sorry about the uh, printer running in the background, but um, just uh, doing a little bit of a print. Anyways, so we have calculated the um, various angles that the actuators need to be manipulators, actuators, effectors, I forget what you call them, um, have to be set at. And so P1 is at that corner and it needs a negative 41 degrees and then 78.96. Um, at this corner, it needs um, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 26 degrees. And remember, the angle is this way. So that negative 41 is down that way. And then etc. etc. Now, a couple of things that I discovered um, while I was doing the calculations. First of all, 
we have to pay particular attention to the arctan and we have basically three cases to consider there is the case where um, x the the position that we're calculating the arctan for by using um, a right angle triangle is in between uh, well sorry let me let me rephrase if the angle is included inside of the right triangle that we're drawing that is one case so um, we're gonna have to write a function in our in our program so that it treats three separate cases um, the first case is if the angle that we're looking for is here and then we're good so we've got y over x take the arctan and it's fine but if the angle that we're looking for is this angle then we have to take the complement with 180 calculating this angle from y over x so taking the absolute value and then there's one other case which happens and that is if you've got um, you're trying to calculate um, this uh, sorry where am I here yeah if we're trying to calculate this angle gamma 1 so gamma 1 could be a natural angle in here or gamma 1 could be this angle and so once again we have to take the complement with 180 so we need to do some checking uh, write a function in our in our program so that it does some checking about which case that we're currently looking at in order to calculate our arctan values so, um, so I hope that makes sense right we've got alpha 2 which we're calculating the um, the length uh, sorry we're calculating the length c1 based on the angle alpha 2 but alpha 2 might be um, might be an obtuse angle so for example here now we've got our triangle located here so now alpha 2 is a um, uh, obtuse angle so we have to do a special case for that so yeah we'll just we'll just make note of those special cases in our in our program we'll write a new function called eight well I don't know what we'll call it because that's one of the hardest problems in computer science isn't it um, but we'll write a function that calculates the tangent that uh, arc tangent of y over x and then take note of which special case that we're we're considering so yeah and in any event we get our range of motion values coming out and by playing with it you can see that that those are going to be limits um, limiting these lower left hand corner the lower left hand corner the lower right hand corner determine the largest extent of negative travel that needs to happen for either of the servos so anything else is going to be in between and we're only going to have to get super high if we wanted to get up there but we're not so this geometry will work and we just need to make note that we have to go between negative 41 and 94 degrees so that's a hundred and fifteen degree spread and here we have to go from negative 32 to 95 and once again that's um, uh, well that's a hundred and twenty seven degrees spread so it all falls within the 180 degree um, uh, travel restrictions that we have because of these guys so now we just have to figure out um, how to uh, 
orient the um, horns on here and calibrate it so that it is um, reading these degrees.